Today we have with us Dr. Taseen Ali, a historian teaching at the Brack University in Dhaka. Dr. Taseen Ali has his PhD from the Houston University main campus in the United States. His area of interest is the period of British colonial rule in Indian subcontinent during the 20th century. Thank you Dr. Taseen Ali for talking to Doordarshan and All India Radio. I understand that Suhas Chandra Bose is an iconic figure and he has inspired the freedom struggle not only during the period of uh, the uh, before 1947 but even now he is one of the iconic figures. Do you think the role of Suhas Chandra Bose was not properly assessed till now that prompted you to write this book and to assess his role in the freedom struggle of India? Uh, that is a very, very good and very relevant question. I think there is certainly that dimension that Netaji's uh, contributions uh, were not properly assessed, were perhaps not properly appreciated, especially in the aftermath of 1947. Uh, also, I should say that um, history is not just about the past, but history is always uh, in motion, um, and um, one of the one of the things that has happened in the past uh, few decades is that we have had uh, the release of more uh, confidential secret documents from the British archives of the British government, the British Raj uh, here in the Indian subcontinent, um, and from uh, and of the British uh, government in London itself. Uh, during that time period, which has allowed us to add more nuance to our understanding of Netaji and his role uh, in the uh, in the struggle for uh, freedom in the Indian subcontinent, and also, uh, if I may just add uh, to that uh, to that point, which is uh, what I've also tried to do in my book is to understand who the British Empire considered as their principal opponents. Um, and how did they view uh, and how, they, how did they try to obstruct their principal opponents? And the title of my book, um, Implacable Foes, is actually taken from the expression implacable foe, uh, which the British Empire used in one of its secret documents to refer to uh, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch, and that is as early as the 1930s. So, uh, so it gives you an idea um, of uh, of the importance of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch in the uh, private uh, and secret uh, perception of the British Raj itself in the Indian subcontinent. So, as you said, that new uh, facts have come to light with the research that you have done on Shubhash Chandra Bosch. Could you uh, just give some examples of the new facts which uh, you have used in your book to 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 understand and uh, elaborate on the role of uh, Suhas Chandra Bose and how he was seen as an implacable foe by the British right from 1930s, as you said. Uh, well, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think um, if you consider the timeline of the British Empire, uh, certainly uh, you have a constitutionalist uh, strand uh, which evolves, of course, uh, as you know, with the uh, with the establishment of the Indian National Congress in 1885. But you have always had a revolutionary armed resistance to the British Empire, and we can trace this right back to 1757, the Battle of Plassey itself, which leads to the conquest of Bengal and eventually the conquest of the subcontinent. So uh, within that framework, the young Shubhash Chandra Bosch, uh, was influenced uh, by the Swadeshi movement of 1905, which was uh, against uh, against the partition of Bengal. Um, and so from that movement, you have the reemergence of an armed uh, revolutionary movement. And Shubhash Chandra Bosch was influenced by many of these uh, revolutionary thinkers, uh, the leaders who were at the forefront of the Swadeshi movement, uh, for, for, for example, uh, Aurobindo Ghosh. And as Shubhash Chandra Bosch evolves uh, into his own as a political thinker, a leader, um, he comes to the conclusion that only armed resistance can uh, overthrow British colonial rule. 
Um, and of course, there are foreign influences as well. Of course, he uh, he was uh, the Bengali revolutionaries and other revolutionaries in the Indian subcontinent were, of course, inspired by other revolutionary struggles, such as in Ireland, the Italian Wars of Independence. Um, and so Shubhash Chandra Bosch, even as he joins the Indian National Congress um, in the 1920s, uh, he is one of the few upcoming leaders who uh, never of never publicly abandons the option of armed struggle and revolution against the British Empire. So I think this in this uh, instantly marks him out as someone to keep an eye on as far as the British colonial administration in the Indian subcontinent is concerned. Um, he is, uh, and we also see this in the way that he is uh, treated by the British Empire. For instance, he is imprisoned uh, without charges in 1925 in horrific conditions in British-occupied Burma. Um, and so, and this, uh, this instead of softening Shubhash Chandra Bosch, in fact, makes him a much stronger uh, individual and confirms in him his uh, convictions that the British Empire uh, must be uprooted from the Indian subcontinent. Now, uh, one of the documents which has come to us um, in recent years, uh, very remarkable, is that during the Second World War, uh, when Netaji dramatically escapes from house arrest in January 1941, uh, the British Empire issues a secret order to its agents um, in various parts of the world to assassinate Shubhash Chandra Bosch uh, as he was making his way to uh, German-occupied Europe, which is, a, which is remarkable uh, considering uh, that no such orders that we know of were ever issued against other um, leaders of the Indian subcontinent during this time. Uh, so this is something that's remarkable. Uh, remarkable and it shows uh, the signal danger that that the British Empire felt in uh, the person of Shubhash Chandra Bosch, because if I may just add uh, this one point, that Shubhash Chandra Bosch had come to the conclusion that the way you could uproot the British Empire, and I don't need to say this, um, as everyone knows, the British Empire was the foremost world power at the time, so you could only do it by the subversion of the colonial mercenary army, the British Indian Army, um, and that, that was the signal danger uh, that the British Empire realized in Shubhash Chandra Bosch, that he would try not only to join hands with the enemies of the British Empire, but he would also try and subvert the loyalty of the British Indian Army to its colonial uh, masters um, in the British Raj in the Indian subcontinent. Yes, uh, indeed, there are several things which marked him out as a revolutionary in his own right and one of the leading lights of that period. But one thing which keeps coming to the mind of any layperson is that at the time when, uh, when Subhash Chandra Bose left, escaped from India and went over to Germany to seek support uh, for India's independence, it remains a mystery, it remains a question that did he not know about the Nazi Germany of that time, uh, about the role of uh, Nazi party in, uh, in, in Germany. Uh, are there any views uh, that you come across uh, expressed by Netaji Subhas Bosch about uh, the German question, Nazi question, and how he kind of reconciled the, the desire for India's independence and fight for it with the abominable things that the Nazis were doing? Uh, again, that is a very good question, and that is one of those uh, that is one of those issues uh, that I've had to look into as well, and which is, of course, uh, something, uh, as you said, everyone thinks about, that how could um, an individual uh, such as Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch uh, consider joining hands uh, with, uh, with such a political system uh, such as Adolf Hitler's uh, National Socialist Germany. Now, Shubhash Chandra Bosch himself was, uh, of course, uh, goes without saying, uh, very, uh, very highly educated, very cognizant of the fact of the dangers posed by fascism. Uh, however, uh, he felt that there was no other alternative if one wanted to take a stand and use this opportunity, this disruption 
uh, in the capitalist world system. This this struggle this struggle was viewed by many. Uh, if I may just uh, add this point before I come back to Netaji and his views of. Um, Nazi Germany, which is that we must also keep in mind that he was not in isolation in this regard. It is controversial, but many, uh, many liberation movements, nationalist struggles uh, uh, saw no other useful alternative but, uh, but to join hands with the tripartite or Axis powers during the Second World War, because for the simple reason that there were no other major powers uh, fighting against the the Western allies, the British Empire, eventually the United States and other countries. Uh, coming back to Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch. Um, now, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch very clearly demarcated uh, his uh, his alliance with uh, Berlin or uh, with, uh, with National Socialist Germany. He was very clear uh, from the onset and throughout his stay in Germany that the only point on which he and uh, Berlin had in common was their fight against the British Empire and nothing else. Uh, if I may, uh, if I may uh, put this point here, when Germany, when Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union in June 1941, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch is in Berlin, and he openly condemns the German invasion of the Soviet Union, which is, uh, which is a very brave thing to do. Uh, one, because, um, as you may know, uh, the Nazis ideologically hated uh, the Soviet Union for, uh, for deep ideological reasons. Um, and so for a guest of uh, Hitler's government uh, while he was in Berlin to openly condemn uh, the German invasion of the Soviet Union was a very brave thing to do. And I think it marks, marks him out as someone who was clearly independent-minded in his objectives, um, and which, again, demarcates, uh, demarcates the fact that he made it very clear that uh, the only point of commonality between Nazi Germany and, uh, and him as a leader of the Indian subcontinent was their fight against the British Empire. And we have numerous other examples where Shubhash Chandra Bosch uh, kept his movement, uh, kept the organizations that he created, for instance, he is going to raise a uh, the fir for the first time a military unit uh, composed of soldiers and civilians from the Indian subcontinent successfully since 1857, which was loyal to the people of the Indian subcontinent, not to the British Empire. I'm talking about the Indian Legion, and there was great interest from uh, other German uh, organizations, military formations, to try and use the Indian Legion. In, against the Soviet Union, but before uh, Netaji left Germany, he gave specific instructions that the Indian Legion must never be used in the struggle against the Soviet Union. It could only be used against the Western Allies, the British Empire, and only in self-defense. And this is uh, and this instruction was followed to the letter by both the German government and by his deputies who remained behind in Germany when he left. Uh, and finally, if I may also add that uh, when Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch created the Provisional Government of Free India in October 1943, he, uh, his government only declared war on the British Empire and the United States, not on the Soviet Union or on China, which again, I think, uh, makes, makes his position very clear that he was only interested in um, only interested in the commonality of the tripartite powers in their stru common struggle against the British Empire and nothing else. Well, you have given a very detailed analysis of the position of Netaji Subhash Bosch in seeking the help of the, uh, of the Nazi Germany to fight the British. Uh, may I ask you, another question that comes to my mind is that the strategic vision of Subhash Chandra Bosch to fight the British with the help of the Axis powers. In substance, this seems that neither Germany nor Japan provided much material support to Suhas Chandra Bose when it's the Indian National Army was advancing and it was on the borders of India near Imphal, on the border of Myanmar. So did Suhas Chandra Bose feel uh, any sense of disillusionment with his uh, whole idea of seeking the help of the British? Of the of the German and 
Japanese forces in, the, in, in fighting the British. Do you think it's a uh, correct way of looking at it? Did he say something about it? Uh, 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 that's again a uh, very good question. If I may answer it in two parts. Uh, first of all, if I, if I may just uh, lay out the strategic situation. Uh, again, Netaji had condemned the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941 because he felt that would be a disastrous move for Germany for herself, uh, which is basically what happened in the First World War as well, um, although uh, with, with a slight difference. Uh, but coming back to the Second World War, so Shubhash Chandra Bosch felt that Germany should have focused on its struggle against the British Empire, not become involved in a two-front war. And so when Germany invades the Soviet Union, uh, he felt that Germany's chances of winning uh, were, uh, were minimal uh, at best, uh, because Germany would have to then take on the British Empire, the Soviet Union, and eventually the United States. Um, German, and so there was no question of Germany or German forces being e ever being able to reach uh, the northwestern approaches to the Indian subcontinent, Afghanistan, uh, that region, uh, into the northwest portion of the Indian subcontinent. Um, Coming to the question of Japan, once uh, Netaji arrives in East Asia in, in July 1943, um, by this time, the strategic, uh, the strategic uh, advantage uh, that Imperial Japan had, had already passed. They had suffered a uh, major strategic de defeat earlier, uh, excuse me, uh, the previous year in June 1942. Um, so Japan was already... Um, on, uh, was already being pushed back. Um, and so, and certainly, uh, Japan was hard pressed for material sources. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why Netaji's Indian National Army faced, um, faced such difficulties in terms of access to materials, uh, weaponry, uh, logistical supplies, uh, in 1943, 1944 during uh, what becomes known as the ba uh, what becomes known as the Battle of Imphal and Kohima. Uh, now, did uh, so coming back uh, now to the second part of your question, did Netaji feel any disillusionment? Uh, he never made any uh, publics uh, as far as uh, as far as I have been able to find. He never made any public statements uh, to the uh, to that fact. Um, and in fact, he uh, and in fact. Uh, Shubhash Chandra Bosch uh, had a very practical, uh, very practical approach uh, to this and uh, to the anti-colonial struggle. In that he felt that if Germany and then Japan were not able to assist the peoples of the Indian subcontinent against the British Empire, then he would look for new allies. And that is why, in August 1945, when Imperial Japan is about to surrender, Shubhash Chandra Bosch seeks out a new ally. And that is, of course, um, the Soviet Union, which in fact had been the ideological enemy of the Allied powers since going back to the Russian Revolution in 1917. Um, so Netaji was very practical in that sense, in that he would take the assistance of any power which was willing to fight against the British Empire or which had conflicts with the British Empire. So th there was no such regret. Uh, Shubhash, Chandra, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bosch, being a man of action, uh, I don't think ever left, room for, uh, ever left room for doubts or regrets. He had utilized the situations as he found them. And when those situations were reversed, he looked for new opportunities. And that is one of the reasons why uh, Netaji asked and received assistance from Japan to carry him to Manchuria, where he hoped to make contact with uh, representatives of the Soviet government. Well, that gives us an idea about the thinking process of uh, Netaji Suhas Chandra Bose. Now, coming to another aspect of Suhas Chandra Bose's life, the relationship between Suhas Bose and Gandhiji. It's a very complex relationship, as you all, as we all know. It's a complex relationship in, in so far as he had ideological differences. Gandhi stood against Swastin Bose, supported Pattabhi Sitaramaya in Congress elections. Many people say unfairly. Yet, Swastin Bose retained a deep affection and respect for, for Gandhiji. And Gandhiji also never looked at 
at uh, Subhash Chandra Bose as an opponent in that sense. So what do, how do you see the relationship between Subhash Chandra Bose and Gandhiji during the freedom struggle and its implication for the Indian national movement or the, or the anti-colonial movement in the British period? Uh, again, a very good question, and uh, certainly, uh, certainly that uh, almost everyone uh, ponders about. Uh, my understanding uh, and uh, my understanding of the sources, my understanding of the situation uh, that Netaji found himself, uh, especially during the Second World War, uh, leads me to a slightly different conclusion. Um, certainly, uh, and certainly there were ideological differences um, uh, when Netaji uh, returns uh, from London in 1921 after he dramatically uh, resigned uh, from the British Indian Civil Service, the Raj bureaucracy which ruled the Indian subcontinent. Uh, he meets with uh, he meets with uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, he was uh, he was not impressed, uh, if I may put it lightly. Um, and so, from that point onward, it's very clear uh, it's very clear that there are going to be ideological differences. Um, and of course, um, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, uh, as as we all know, the word Mahatma. Uh, means uh, great, uh, great soul. Uh, but Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bosch once said that if there was a great soul in the Indian subcontinent, uh, that person was his own political chief and mentor, uh, Desh Bundhu Chitraranjan Dash, um, his, uh, his leader uh, who he tragically uh, lost only after a four-year political apprenticeship. Uh, now, um, Certainly, um, there are, so for instance, once, uh, so coming back to this question, um, I think sometimes we have to read between the lines, and that is, th that is the conclusion that I have reached. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things uh, that is pointed to is that Netaji uh, referred to Mahatma Gandhi as father of the nation uh, from a speech uh, broadcast from East Asia in 1944. Uh, however, I would, I would say, uh, and this is my conclusion, that a lot of this has to be read between the lines. Uh, for instance, in this context, Netaji takes charge of the, um, of the Indian Independence League, which represented the nearly 3 million overseas uh, people from the Indian subcontinent in East Asia. And they were following uh, on paper, at least, the Indian National Congress in the Indian subcontinent itself. So my understanding is, is that Netaji didn't want to split um, the movement that he took charge of in 1943 even further. Uh, and that is why he retained uh, many of the, uh, many of these, um, many of these statements which, uh, which implied uh, which implied uh, solidarity with Mahatma Gandhi in the Indian subcontinent. But now, at the same time, however, interestingly, uh, when he was in East Asia, Netaji in private um, said to a number of his, uh, a number of his uh, colleagues and associates that he did not have faith in uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, leadership uh, of the Indian National Congress and the other leaders around um, around uh, the leader, the overall higher command of the Indian National Congress. So my conclusion is is that uh, we have to uh, we have to read between the lines. Uh, we don't know what might have happened had Netaji returned. Um, and also, if I may say this, and we also have uh, found uh, speeches by Netaji again from East Asia in in 1945, where he is very critical of. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi and the other higher uh, higher command leaders of the Indian National Congress. Um, if I may just add uh, regarding Mahatma Gandhi's views of Shubhash Chandra Bosch, um, during the time when the Indian National Army officers' trial creates such a revolutionary upsurge um, in the Indian subcontinent itself, once they had been brought back by the British Empire, um, again I think uh, there was such popular uh, love and affection uh, and support for the Indian National Army, Shubhar Chandra Bosch, um, that I don't think anyone could have, even Mahatma Gandhi, could have said anything negative about Shubhar Chandra Bosch publicly without, um, without 
uh, generating um, a backlash from ordinary people. And again, we have, I have found documents um, in the British archives where in secret correspondence between British colonial uh, officials and leaders of the Indian National Congress, they have said, the Indian National Congress leaders have said that they cannot take a stand against Shubhash Chandra Bosch because they would lose ground uh, amongst the population. So uh, so my conclusion is, is that we have to read between the lines. Uh, again, we don't know how this relationship might have evolved between Netaji and Mahatma Gandhi had Netaji returned, uh, but certainly um, right through this time, I think we have to read the we have to read these public statements um, uh, between the lines and within the context in which they were made. Let me come back to towards the final uh, part of this uh, conversation. Let me come back to the first question that I asked: Do you think Netaji needs reassessment in so far as his contribution and role? In the, in the anti-colonial movement is concerned. And what are the key points of that reassessment in your opinion? Uh, I, I think definitely, I, uh, the, the point I had mentioned, which is that history is not about the past. History is always in motion. Uh, we, fi- we have found, we, uh, we have found new, uh, new evidence of different, um, uh, different statements, uh, s- s- that secret assassination order, for instance, by the British Empire. So I certainly think we need, uh, we need, uh, we need a, a, a really, uh, a really comprehensive assessment of Netaji's role in the anti-British struggle, not only for the struggle itself, but I think Netaji's life, his struggle, uh, his belief in secularism, uh, all of this, I think, has very much relevance right down to the present day um, as, a, as what is possible to, to achieve uh, amicable, equitable relationships between peoples across the Indian subcontinent, across uh, the peoples of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So I think his message, uh, so his life and his message are definitely uh, applicable and relevant to the present day. And that is why I think a continuing assessment of his uh, life, his mission, um, his struggle is uh, continuously needs to be reassessed and needs to be held up as a model, I believe, to the entire subcontinent. One last question, which has inspired so many movies, so many fictional writings. Did Sebastian Bos really die in that accident? Did you find any material relating to it? Uh, yes, um, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, there is, there is, there is no doubt that uh, that tragically uh, Netaji died um, on that uh, on that fateful uh, flight, uh, which was taking him, uh, which was taking him to Manchuria, the uh, the plane which crashed uh, in Tha- in Tha- on the island of Taiwan. In uh, on the 18th of August 1945, uh, the evidence is uh, irrefutable. Uh, we now have more evidence, for instance, of eye, uh, eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts that we simply have too much evidence um, to to say otherwise. Uh, I, I know there. Uh, I know for a lot of people, given what Shubhash Chandra Bosch had already achieved up to that point, it may seem. Uh, it, it almost seems it almost seems that for someone who had achieved so much, who had taken so many risks, that it was almost impossible for him uh, to meet such a tragic fate. But uh, tragically, um, the the evidence uh, the evidence um, the evidence points to um, the the evidence points to the tragic event uh, which led to Netaji sustaining. Uh, sustaining those uh, sustaining those injuries uh, that led to his death on the island of Taiwan. So that so uh, the evidence uh, I believe, and that is my conclusion as well, is irrefutable, and um, that is the conclusion that I have reached as well. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Tasin Ali, for talking to Doordarshan and All India Radio and giving such an elaborate and scholarly understanding and analysis of. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, whose role is being now reassessed across the globe by scholars of the Indian modern history. And I believe your book will have many more nuggets of, uh, uh, of analysis and truth in it. 
which would be read by the people who are interested in the anti-colonial struggle of India or Indian subcontinent in the 20th century. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for in inviting me and taking the time to talk to me. Thank you so much.